thanks again for, for the invitation. Okay, so my goal is to continue somehow from the first lecture. And a little, uh, so, for, so for, sorry, before I start, everything I'm going to say today is a joint work with uh, James McKernan. And actually, I should say that uh, I gave a few talks about this, so I'm sorry if you heard this story in advance. Uh, we're making slowly progress, so you probably hear something different this time. But still, it's a long term project with James. Okay, so the goal is somehow to understand singularities in the minimum of the program. This morning we talk about singularities, and the goal is somehow to refine what we were talking about this morning. So the main, one of the main reasons, although it's not the only reason, is that we talk about, this morning we talk about um, termination of flips. So there is an important result by Shokuro, well, which I'm gonna be very vague by motivating my talk, which says that to prove the termination of flips is equivalent to understanding KLT singular. I mean, to prove the termination of single flips is, um, requires, or at least, it's, a, it's implied by understanding KLT singularity. I'm gonna be very vague, I'm gonna be more precise later on. So motivated by this, our goal is to somehow try to understand KLT singularities, at least in dimension three, although termination is known, but still there are many things which are still unclear. So okay, let me start to be more formal. Okay, so in first of all, I will work in a different setup compared to this morning. This morning I was working with the projective variety, now we do exactly the opposite. I'm gonna work locally around the point. So for me, in all this talk, X would be always normal, exactly like this morning, will be always Q factorial. And this is important for what I'm gonna say later on. And also, uh, uh, define over the complete numbers. And we fix a point P in X, and we always work on the germ around P. So in a sense, we work in analytics uh, category rather than uh, algebraic. So it's not even al quite algebraic. I mean, it's, sorry, it's not even uh, uh, quasi projective. It's really around, uh, locally around the point P. And again, as before, I will work, I mean, I will always assume that n is the dimension of x, and I'm mostly interested in the case two and three. So let's go back to this statement. So the idea is that among many, many singularities, historic singularities, are those that we like the most, although they are very difficult. But what we want to show is that somehow the difficulties that are hidden with toric varieties are pretty much the difficulties that we should expect in general. So in a sense, we want to understand how, what's the relation between KLT singularities and toric singularities. Toric singularities are always KLT, but of course the opposite is not true. So now my goal is, what is the relation? I mean, how far is from being true? Okay. So let me start from a characterization of toric varieties, of toric singularities, sorry. So this is an easy fact, but uh, somehow it will be important for everything I'm gonna say later on. So first of all, let's suppose like this morning we have a pair. So I'm gonna work with something like uh, a Q device or delta, where exactly like this morning, AI are coefficient within zero and one, and uh, one including the rational. Okay, so now I'm gonna assume that X delta is locanonical first. So sorry, I should say that since we only work around the point P, I'm gonna assume, even if I, I don't write it later on, is that P is a point in SI for all I. Otherwise, it makes no sense to work around P, I suppose. Okay, so the first thing that is trivial, I mean, it's 
very basic result, is that if x delta is log canonical, then the sum of the coefficient of i is less than n, less equal than n. Okay, so this is somehow the first thing that one study. I mean, it's a quite an easy result. It uh, can be checked directly. What is a bit less trivial, though it's easy, is that if equality holds, so if x delta is log canonical, and the quality holds, then the pair is toric. What does it mean the pair is toric? It means, of course, the tax is toric, and all the components of delta are invariant. Again, we are talking about germ of singularity, so I'm only looking at it from an um, analytic point of view. So there is an analytic isomorphism to a toric variety in such a way that the component of delta are uh, invariant. If you work on a projective variety, then I would ever say that x delta is toroidal. Um, so and delta and the components of delta. So somehow this very, very simple principle will be the, uh, somehow the way that we will try to understand toric varieties, I mean, sorry, KLT pairs in um, dimension three. Okay, so let me start with an example. I mean, uh, how things work. Maybe I should say a little bit more. Uh, so maybe vice versa. If uh, X is toric and S1 and SN are the invariant, so of course, please take point with respect of uh, the toric action. So if these are invariant divisor, then the pair given by all the components of coefficient one is toric, is toroidal, so well, is toric, yes, it is toric. And in part, in even more, we can say, we can say that KX plus the sum of SI is Cartier. Which is very strong because if we take this device independently, then not Cartier. I mean, KX might be very far from being Cartier. It could be, uh, thanks. Is, yeah, thanks, sorry. Because it's toric, it means toric. Uh, so, so individually, this device is not Cartier. Kx, I mean, if x is, has a singularity, uh, clearly Kx is not Gorenstein. I mean, x is not Gorenstein, so clearly it wouldn't be true. But if you add all this together, then uh, this is true. And again, also this would be somehow useful for us. But let me start with some examples to clarify the picture. Yes, uh, very much so, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, the example that I'm gonna show, you will see that it fails to be true if, uh, if if we drop this assumption. So um, let's, let's talk about surfaces. Surfaces are easy, but nevertheless, they do hide lots of, uh, of this property. Um, so as I said, although we take uh, pairs, my variety X will be always KLT. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say, that's what I was missing. It's gonna be norm and KLT. So uh, without delta, I'm always assume, even if I forget, I will always assume that the, um, variety without a boundary is gonna be KLT. Sorry, so this will be always part of my assumption. Although, of course, here it's obvious, but uh, later on I will be always using the fact that X is KLT. Otherwise, something would not be true. Okay, sorry, so what does it mean to be KLT? So there's a very easy characterization of KLT surfaces, which is the same as saying, at least analytically, that they are quotient singularity. So everyone knows that there are three classes of, three families of singularities, so which are A, D, E, where uh, these correspond to the diagram of um, the exception, defined by the exception locus of uh, the minimal resolution. So let me start to describe this picture. Let me start from the A family. So you probably, everyone probably knows that AK singularities are always toric, but let me try to show why this is true. 
So what is an AK singularity? So I'm always taking a, a minimal solution. And I'm going to denote it by H. And then I look at exceptional locus. And the exceptional locus defined graph with this intersection. So the, the graph associated to H looks like this. So it's just a, a part. So each of these vertex correspond to an exceptional divisor, and two vertices meet if they um, intersect transversally. So in other words, what it means is that the exceptional locus of H is just a given, it's a path that's given by this one, where these are the exceptional divisors. Okay, so these are the objects that uh, are contracted by H. Okay, so what I'm going to do, and what is always possible to do, is to define two curves which meet the tails transversally. So I'm going to call it C1, or maybe let me call it C prime 1 and C prime 2. So in other words, what I'm doing is to add one curve here and one curve here. And again, I'm assuming that the intersection is transversal. So now we are on, a, on a X tilde. We are on the resolution. Okay, so what do we do? We take the image of these guys. So let's suppose that ci is equal to h of c tilde i. I, of course, one or two. Okay, then it's a pure calculation is to show that if I take the pair c1 plus c2, then this is log canonical. I mean, it just an easy calculation of the discrepancy. I will talk about discrepancy in a few minutes, but uh, it can be easily checked by hand that, that everything behaves very, no, very, very um, naturally. Okay, so what does it mean? We have, of course, that the sum of the coefficient is equal to two, which is equal to the dimension of the variety. And so everything here is respected. So in particular, x c1 plus c2 will be toric. In particular, x is toric. Okay, so any AK singularity is toric. And somehow, although it's not the only way, actually, maybe not even the easiest way, but this is a natural way to prove it. Okay, so let's change the family. Uh, let's consider DK singularities, which are slightly more complicated. And oh, sorry, I should just say that in particular, KX, although it's simple, but KX by C1, C2, is Cartier. Yeah, 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 I mean, uh, but it's, it's a way to apply this example. Yeah, yeah, the, I say, as I say, it's not the easiest way to prove it, but it's uh, historic. I mean, uh, everything makes sense so far. Okay, so let's do decay time similarities. I mean, clearly, there's no way to generalize equation in higher dimension. So. Somehow, if there's a way to characterize toric variety, from my point of view, is at least in Russian geometry, it's this one. Okay, for DK singularity, the graph looks slightly different, although not very different. And it's something like this. So in other words, there is one fork. And these guys are exception device, so, and just in terms of, maybe I should say man, minus two, sorry. And I would, I would denote in zero and D minus one, these two tails. Okay, so again, there are many, many ways to show that this is not toric. But one possible way, if you want to check, I mean, if you want to do an exercise, is to show that there exists, so it's easy to show, you can, I mean, it's doable by hands. So there exists no delta on X, Sorry. Such that uh, delta is reduced, and k x plus delta is cut here. Uh, well, of course, the trigger case. So let's see if delta is not here. Okay. So again, I, this is by far not the best way to prove that x is not toric, but surely works. Uh, so in particular, X is not toric. OK, 
OK, so before I continue, I should say that for E6, there, you know, there are three more, family, three more uh, classes of singularity, 67 and 8. And the picture is extremely similar to this one, except for the fact that tail is here. It's a bit longer. So there is no difference between uh, DK or ND67 and D8 in terms of this kind of calculations. OK, so but let me say, let me go back to my principles, saying that what is the relationship between KLT and toric? So it looks like there are many, many kind of singularities which are far away from being toric. So let's study this picture a little bit more carefully. I want to go back to DK singularity. So let's suppose that X tilde, exactly like before, is the minimal resolution. for a decay singularity. OK, so what I can do, and what it's easy to do, I mean, this is uh, known for a long time, is that it's possible to factorize this morphism in such a way that, so there exists a factorization. So where this map is H, I'm going to call this F and this G. So such that, OK, I'm going to be a bit sloppy. So let's see if you forgive me. The exceptional locus of G corresponds to, actually, let me do it formally. So it corresponds to, let's see, um, E1. So if F of E1. Wow. Well, but anyway, yeah. E prime 1 where E prime 1 is the three strict transform with 1 here. So, so what does it mean? Uh, it means that, I mean, it's very simple to describe rather than to write down. It means that F contracts all the curves in this graph except for E1, and G contracts E1. So it just, I mean, you could have chosen many, many different ways, but this is what I like. So what does it mean in terms of the picture? So you have, we have our singular point P in X, which is a DK singularity. Then we have a variety X tilde, which is smooth. But also we have uh, Y somewhere in the middle. So how the, of course, here there's a point. And here, the difference between X and Y is just an exception device for uh, E prime 1. If you look at it, there are three singular points on E prime 1. Why? Because it's like, another way to say is that uh, why uh, the map from x theta to x contract everything else but not E1. So in other words, this one will be contracted to a point, this one will be contracted to a point, and all these will be contracted to a point. So there will be three special points. So these two will correspond to these two tails. It's 0 minus 1. So if you, if you look at it, these are A2 singularities. I mean, A1 singularities. Why? Well, my previous notation is E1 because they correspond to a, s a simple graph of one vertex only. And this one, let's see, should be k minus 3. This is an a k minus 3 singularity. OK, so this is y. This is y, actually, of course. OK, so what does it mean? It means that after extracting one device, I mean, after only modifying x to y by um, creating one single device, so we get in something which is toric. Why? Because we sh showed a few, few minutes ago that being a k is equivalent to be to, to, uh, toric. So in other words, maybe I should be more precise than why is toroidal? Because of course it's not a germ anymore. It contains a proper curve. So why is toroidal? OK, so what do we show? I mean, again, it's nothing very serious. It's nothing very deep. But what we show is that in one step, we were able to um, take a variety which is not tor toric into something which is toroidal, which is locally toroidal. So somehow, and the same story, exactly the same kind of calculation applies for E6, E7, and E8. So in a sense, it's like saying that KLT surfaces are one step away from being toric, whatever it means. Sorry? What else? I mean, KLT singularities are all of these two. It's a classification of KLT singularity for dimension two. 
No, no, I mean, healthy singularity is only quotient pervasive. There is, I mean, a classic result about groups of uh, SO3, something like that. It's, um, oh, that's a kind of irrational curve. My curve is a one singularity. It's, um, yeah, what we described this, this morning. So I don't care. I mean, from my point of view, it's the contraction of one curve of minus n. For me, that's a one, A1 singularity. No, A1. So A1 means one, it's enough to extract one curve to resolve it. That's what it means for me. It doesn't mean that the self-intersection is minus n, if that's what you have in mind. OK, so, so yeah, it's nothing about self-intersections. It's all about how many divisors you extract. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. OK, so I was just saying uh, the motto of what we learned so far is that healthy singularities are uh, one step away from being toric. OK. So what about dimension three? Is it possible to look at this picture in dimension I mean, what happens in dimension three? I should say that things become much, much more complicated. And we are far away from understanding healthy singularities in dimension three. So what do we hope that is true in dimension, in dimension three? So first of all, one thing that I would like to talk about, although it's not very much related with this, but just to explain the model, I'm not going to use it. But if you restrict your singularity to terminal, then we know from Mori that Mori terminal singularities are somehow classified. Yep. That's right. I don't mean Duval. That's what I say. The that's right. It's ADE. That's right. Right. So, I'm, like I said before, I don't mean that this self intersection is minus two. It can be any arbitrary number. And whichever number, combination number you choose, there will be. Oh, it's the only thing is that this will be minus two and this is minus two. All the other can be whatever you want. Yes. Thank you. But it's, I think it's a standard notation to call it ADE, nevertheless. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So terminal singularities, again, this is due to Mori. We know that they can always be deformed. Into varieties. Oh. Yes, thank you. Uh, can it be more into varieties that are that have only cyclic quotient singularities? So from this point of view, they're very similar to Bitoric as well. But this is not, the, I mean, although it's a very, very nice result, and it, was, it turned out to be very, very useful for many results in the minimum of the program dimension three, is not the point of view we're going to take. It just tried to justify the fact that, uh, again, singularity in variation geometry shouldn't be too far away from being um, toric. Now, before I state the results and before I try to some, somehow ju justify why we care about this result, let me let me give some definition. Let me say in which context we need this object. I mean, how do we pos Of course, for surface edge, it is very easy because we start from the opposite. We start from the classification and we check that something like this is true. So we are somehow cheating, although we have a different proof of this without using classification. But nevertheless, we use a very, very easy background. So for three folds and so on, even just this diagram fails. So we need to be much more, or even the existence of minimal resolution fails. So we need to be much more careful in dimension three, uh, let alone dimension higher than three. OK, so at the moment, I'm any dimension. So since we never talk about log discrepancy, very briefly, I want to define what is the log discrepancy of a pair. So let's suppose that the x delta is a log pair. And let's suppose that f from y to X, it's a log resolution. 
So what it means is that uh, uh, y smooth and the device associated, which I'm going to define in one minute, uh, the device associated is uh, log smooth. OK, so what is the device associated? Well, what we want to compare is the strict transform of, so k okay, has the strict transform of delta, which I'm going to define exactly like I say, f minus 1 star delta, with kx of delta. So exactly like this morning, these two objects, outside the exceptional locus, they are exactly the same uh, divisor, because I'm not changing anything. So whatever the difference is, is going to be supporting device or in uh, exception devices. And the standard notation, at least for many people, the standard notation is to, define, to denote the, no the difference this way, 1 minus AI. I'm going to justify why in one minute, but for a moment, let me say that E1 and K are the exception device of F. OK. So these numbers, it's what we usually denote as log discrepancy. So the AI depends only on the valuation, doesn't depend on the log resolution we are considering. So they are just associated to the perx delta, and of course, to they are computed with respect to VI. So the usual notation is uh, AIX delta. And this is what we denote as log discrepancy. So if you want, this is a definition. It's also a definition of X delta with respect to uh, EI. OK, so what does it mean to be KLT? So for instance, X delta is KLT. It's equivalent to what we were saying this morning. If and only if AI is greater than 0 for uh, all i. And it's log canonical if and only if these numbers are greater than 0 for any i. So OK, I could say much more definition, DLT, and so on, which I might need later on. But uh, uh, the idea is this. The num these numbers measure how singular the pair is. The smaller these numbers are, the more singular this, this pair is. Okay, so that's why somehow we have inequalities. So um, somehow, in the same way as singularities for surfaces are measured by the self-intersection of the curves in the exceptional locus, somehow this number is much more precise from the point of view. It measures uh, how singular the pair is with respect of any evaluation. Okay, so for instance, there are many, many things that are important related to this number. Again, for our purpose, x will always be KLT without considering delta. So one fact that we proved uh, some time ago in BCHM is that if you have F1, Fk, so exactly like I'm going to use um, Vlad's notation, geometric evaluation. So as I say, these numbers can be defined for any geometric evaluation. You just take a log resolution which extracts those geometric evaluations. Such that, so R geometric, such that the log discrepancy is within 0 and 1. It's very important that they're within 0 and 1 and not bigger than 1. Although, in a sense, bigger than 1, it means that they're more smooth. But nevertheless, it's more important this way. Uh, then there exists always a map f from y to x such that the exceptional locus of f is exactly equal to uh, the union of f i. I should just say that exactly like in my beginning, x is kill t in this curvatorial. OK, and this is true in any dimension. We can always extract whatever we want. It's a, follow, it's a result that follows from the MMP. But somehow the idea is this. Uh, we had this diagram a few minutes ago where we could extract only um, e prime one, E1. Here we do exactly the same thing. We, we extract whatever we want as long as this property is true. And of course, we are in this context. So 
the only thing that we need to pay attention is that there is no such a factorization. We only know the existence of these morphisms here. No, x scale t is enough. As long as x scale t is very important, yeah. Log canonic is not enough. And of course, we want this property between zero and one. I mean, actually, sorry, zero is good. It's very important. Zero is good. Sorry. X must be KLT, but the log discrepancy could be equal to zero. Because I'm going to use it all the time, so thanks for remarking. OK, so we have one of the tools that we need a few minutes ago. Just now, what I did was to extract one of these curves. So. Here, of course, things are more complicated. We can only extract them. We can, uh, but nevertheless, is um, uh, I mean, it's good enough for many of our purposes. Another thing that I should say is a definition, which I'm going to use very often. So we say that if um, f has log discrepancy equal to zero. And f is contained in exceptional locus of some map f, where f goes from y to x. I don't care which, what is f exactly. Then, sorry. Then uh, the image of f is called log canonical center. So this word, log canonical center, appears very often in many contexts. One of the contexts where it appears very often is multiplier ideal shifts. So the idea is that those places are where we can extract, uh, we can lift section from, because we can, we can use a junction. Um, the way we're going to use it is slightly different. We're going to see how the log canonical center play a role for us. OK. so. Let me go back to log discrepancy. So, so the idea at the beginning I say that Shokurov intuition was that if we understand singularities very well, then somehow we, we do have termination of flips. So now I would like to be a little bit more precise of what that means. So it's what motivates my talk somehow. So I'm going to talk about two conjecture, two big conjecture. One is called ACC for MLD, which means that um, let's suppose that, uh, maybe I should say, I should give some definition first. Okay, let's try. So let's suppose that I is a set within 0 and 1, which satisfy DCC. So what does it mean DCC? Uh, DCC means there exists no Um, uh, strictly decreasing sequence inside i. If you want, a very important case of this conjecture is assume that i is the empty set, which of course is satisfied this is here. And consider, fix the dimension n. So I'm sorry, I should continue here. Then, so I should have done before, but I'm going to define MLD later on in one moment. Then, the set of all the AX delta, where X, so I'm going to define what this number is, apologize for that, where X is of dimension N. And uh, sorry, x delta is scale t. And the coefficient of delta are inside i satisfies ACC. So what does it mean, ACC? Well, you can imagine it's exactly the opposite uh, of what this is it means. It means there is no strict increase in sequence. Inside the set. So, okay, sorry, I should have defined what is AX delta. 
uh, I didn't do it before. It's the minimum of all the log discrete functions with respect to all the evaluation of uh, uh, x. So, and this minimum is achieved. It's a real minimum. Okay. So, a few remarks. The first remark is that. This is not true if we drop this assumption of taking the minimum. Namely, if we just consider all the possible discrepancies of all the possible pairs, which even if we assume it delta equal to zero, uh, uh, of a given dimension n, even dimension two, it's clearly, it's very, very wild. I mean, all, pretty much the numbers that we get are dense among the rational number, uh, the, among the real numbers within zero and one. So clearly, to take the minimum is necessary in the conjecture. The second thing, which is probably more important, so somehow this is sharp. The second thing that is important about this conjecture is that um, Shokuro proved that ACC plus some other conjecture for which I'm not talking about, but it's called lower, con lower con semi continued, sorry, for the low discrepancy implies termination flips. So uh, this is about also somehow studying this number, but from a different point of view. It's about changing the center that we look at. But somehow, this is one of the main ingredients in Shokurov's plan to prove the mention of flips um, uh, that we are considering. So it's, it motivates somehow our interest in this study. OK, another conjecture which is different somehow, but a similar flavor, and I'm going to talk about later on as well, is BNB. So where BNB stands for Borisov, let's say Borisov. So which says that uh, let's fix again n. Let's fix also a positive, in, a positive number, sorry, epsilon. And let's consider the, all the final pair. So let's suppose, sorry, I as above as uh, previous conjectures. Let's, let's consider all the pairs x delta such that Okay, sorry. This time we really maybe. Sorry, let me call it y gamma because I say the text is always non projective, but in this case it's going to be projective. So, such that y is projective and um, minus k y plus gamma is final, is sample. And also the coefficient of gamma are inside i. And sorry, and all these are natural conditions, but somehow they need to appear. And also the log discrepancy of y gamma, it's bigger than epsilon. Then this, uh, again, an interesting example is when gamma, uh, when i is the empty set. If you take gamma to be zero, it's already a very difficult conjecture, um, which is worth of examining. So this is a, f uh, it's a bounded family. So you see that it's not true if I assume epsilon equal to zero. So in other words, if I just assume y gamma to be KLT, even for surfaces, very easy to produce example of uh, surfaces which do not live, uh, I mean, infinity many surfaces which do not live in the same family. So somehow this condition is necessary. Of course, all the others are necessary, but this is the one that looks like it shouldn't be there, but we need it, and it's about singularities. Okay. So, sorry, I'm losing a bit of time. But let me say what we know about this conjecture. So I think Alexeyev proved this conjecture in dimension two. And they're not completely obvious conjecture. I mean, they're, okay, they're not too difficult, but somehow, if you look at the proof, it's, it's fairly complicated. And also, uh, okay, let me get the no names right. So Borisov, and then Lawrence, and then Ambro. I suppose, I mean, maybe I should have written this guy first and then Borisov and then Ambro. Uh, they proved that both the conjecture, uh, sorry, uh, 
ACC is true for solid prayer. Also, BNB is true, but I don't remember who is there. But maybe Boris will prove that uh, BNB is true for toric pairs. So what is the principle here? It princi the principle is that, although these are not easy results, I mean, the proof is fairly complicated, but somehow uh, what we hope is that all the difficulties are hidden here, are hidden within toric pairs. And somehow this justifies why we look for a toric modification, which is what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. So, before I can talk about toroid modification, I need to talk about something else. Which is very much related with what I said at the beginning, complements. And again, this concept is due to Shokuro. So, why do I need to talk about complements? The idea is this. We, at the very beginning, I say we want to study KLT pairs, X delta. But then I talk about local chemical centers, and I say that local chemical centers play an important role for us. So somehow, what's the, I mean, KLT do not have any local chemical centers. So what is the relation between these two objects? So let's suppose that. So this is a conjecture. So let's suppose that X delta is a KLT pair. And again, where delta, sorry, let's fix n and i is above. So i is DCC. Then there exists a number r, which depends on n and i, such that if x delta is a Kelty pair, then there exists theta greater or equal than delta. R depending on n and i. So we fix n and i, and then there is a constant r, which is an integer, which only depends on the dimension of the set i. That's wrong. That's the easiest part I've ever written. r equal to r over n i. Okay? So there is this theta uh, greater or equal than delta, such that. First of all, x theta is log canonical but not KLT. But you see, this is very easy to achieve. I mean, it's always possible to do that without any restriction on the dimension, without any restriction of delta. You just take any favorite device or you go to the log canonical threshold and you obtain this. So, so far, it's nothing very interesting. The most important thing, which is very much what I related, I said before, is that not only this is true, but a t times kx, sorry, maybe s times kx plus delta, k theta, is Cartier. I'm going to show why this is important. Uh, sorry, where s is less or equal than r for some s less or equal than r. So why is this important? Well, for instance, one thing which I explained before is that if x delta is toric, then there is a one complement. So x, yep. Sorry? Well, because r depends on i. Oh, uh, delta, sorry, thank you. Uh, delta is in, uh, in i. Um, so one thing, one easy remark which shows, again, the toric varieties are easy from our point of view. Uh, so if x delta is toric, sorry, I should say, uh, x delta is called uh, a s complement. It's not quite the Shukurov notation, but uh, it's very similar. Um, so the remark is that if x delta is toric, which again means No, 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 that's right. It could have more, it could have more components. Yeah, 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 it could have more components, that's right. So yeah, there are examples where, so if for instance, take P1, I mean, 
again, although, I mean, okay, look, do it globally because this is a version globally. Take P1 and take a half a point, then you need to introduce another point. So very much, yeah, it's possible to have more components. Okay, so if X delta is toric, so again, toric means that X is toric and all the components of delta are invariant, then we show before then there exists one complement. Okay, so what we proved, again, it's no big deal, but still, in dimension three, of course, dimension two was known before, there exists always, uh, this is true, the conjecture is true. So at least this is done for us. I mean, uh, we know uh, how to deal with this uh, for threefolds. In the higher dimension, I should say that the way we prove this, and it's pretty much standard, is to use this conjecture in dimension two. And what we believe is true, and actually we believe in a big induction, is that this conjecture in dimension m minus one, b and b conjecture, sorry, this conjecture in, m, in dimension m minus one should imply existence of complements in dimension n although there are still many things missing. Uh, okay, so, so uh, it's not true because I didn't prove it, but the vague idea is that B and B in dimension N minus one should imply, which I don't know, uh, existence of complements in dimension n. I mean, the existence of means this conjecture. But again, I don't even know how to prove this implication, let alone B and B conjecture. What's wrong? <laughs> you should sit in front. B and B in dimension n minus one. <laughs> existence of comp vague idea. Okay. So, yeah, but again, I'm not gonna talk about that and uh, we don't know how to prove it. We, we are dreaming of uh, everything should be related, but uh, just because. Right, 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 right. So complements exist, local complements exist in dimension three. What a word, I never talk about global complements. X is the germ of a singularity, it's the first thing that I say. As I say, it, X is always local. It's nothing about, X is not projective. And it's very important, otherwise it's false. Plenty of, I mean, you can come out as many context samples you want. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot around analytical around the point, yes. But being Cartier, it's well behaved from this point of view. So, I should say that Okay, I don't want to go too much into this vague idea, but global complements in dimension minus one should imply existence of complements in dimension But again, I don't want to go into this. All we know is that in dimension three of it, it's okay. Okay, so now we can talk finally about toroidal modification. So the idea is that I'm gonna start from theta. I mean, I have a Celtic pair, I have a complement, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna have something which is uh, of the form X theta, where theta is log canonical but not Celtic. Again, whatever I'm gonna write, it's true even for Celtic, not, not necessarily log canonical, I mean not log canonical, but uh, it means nothing if you write in the context. So let's suppose that X theta is a log canonical pair. Yes. Uh, no, 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 not that I'm aware of. Because it's far away from being constructive. The problem is BNB is not constructive, so. Right, yes, exactly. Yes comes from, from BNB conjecture. And BNB conjecture, uh, first of all, we don't know how to prove it, but whatever proof we have in mind is not gonna give a constructive method. It's very similar to um, Hickon and McKernan existence of boundedness for varieties general type. There's no way to do anything constructive here. It's not gonna work. So again, it's just a vague idea, but uh, whatever vague idea we have, 
it's not going to be constructed at all. Even for surface, I mean, even for three, for the number is huge. I mean, and it's far away from the optimal. Okay, so let's suppose that x that is a log canonical pair, and let's suppose that f from y to x is a probable rational map. Then f is called, many people are not happy about this notation, but it doesn't matter, a toroidal modification. Mostly people in toroidal geometry. If the following holds. Um, so, first of all, every divisor, uh, we're talking about factorial variety, so we don't extract curves, we only extract, we don't extract anything of dimension uh, less than n minus one. So any device which is extracted, for all E inside the exceptional locus of F, the log discrepancy of F, of V, sorry, the log discrepancy of E, with respect of x theta is equal to zero. So in particular, this says that, again, so it means that if x delta is, x theta is kill t, there is nothing, I mean, interesting about this, of course. So what this means is that, if you remember the definition of log discrepancy, all the divisor which appear as exceptional divisor of f, appear as coefficient one in this formula. Because the formula was one minus something, and the something is equal to zero. Okay, so as usual, uh, theta y is the three transform of uh, theta. Okay, so, so far, we didn't say anything. The second property is that if we take this pair here, This is toroidal at the generic point of every local canonical center. Okay, so this is a definition. Um, what does it mean? It means that wherever we are interested to study, meaning wherever there is a local canonical center, it's going to behave like very much like a toric variety. Exactly like before, what it means is that y is toroidal at the generic point, and this divisor is um, uh, supported by invariant divisors. So it's if, if the first example that I took, DK, well, the second example that I took, decay singularities, it's an example of toroidal modification, of course, for some pairs. So, of course, as I say, this is just a definition. I didn't state any theorem. There are many, many toroidal modification. So, for instance, if you know uh, DLT blow-ups, it's an example of uh, toroidal modification. So unfortunately, I don't have time to define DLT blow up. I think this was proven by Kohl and Kovac, uh, the existing DLT blow ups. Uh, nevertheless, the standard, I mean, now there is the standard notation in uh, Russian geometry. But the idea is that, uh, let me give an example. If we start with the AK singularity, and we take the two invariant divisor, a DLT blow up will be exactly the minimum resolution. So these two curves are the strict transform of these two. It's the one that drawn purple uh, at the beginning of this lecture. And this had all the exception devices. So this is an example of toroidal modification, and it's a DLT blow up. What is the problem? The problem is that it's far away from being economic. Or in other words, the number of exception divisor of this morphism is arbitrarily large. 
Okay, so I don't think I have time to talk about proofs, but uh, let me talk about the main statement, uh, main, main theorem. And we do, well, we do hope that it's very much the beginning of a proof of ACC conjecture, but anyway, the theorem with uh, James is that, let's suppose that X is exactly like before, sorry, X delta is kill, sorry, let me take X kill T and um, Q factorial. Let's suppose that X theta is slow canonical. This is a very, very important assumption. Without KLT or without Q factorial, whatever I'm gonna say for you know, plenty of, I mean, there are counterexample due to color. Then, sorry, of dimension three. Then there exists theoretical modification Sorry, I should just say something else. At the very beginning, I should just say there exists N, such that if this is true, then there exists an authority modification, such that the number of exception divisor is bounded by N. Okay, so let me, let me go back to the examples. So look at this example. If you look at this example, there's no way to, blow, to bound the number of components because K can be arbitrary large. K, from my point of view, from my notation, denotes exactly number of components. So the number of exception divisors of this DLT blow up is far away from bounded, for a bounded uh, from a bounded number. I mean, in this case, uh, uh, M. On the other hand, this is not the toroidal modification we like. Because if we take the identity, then since we said at the beginning this is already toroidal, this is a waste of time for our point of view. We should have taken the identity as f. So clearly the number of exception devices is equal to zero, which is bounded. If we take DK singularities, then uh, we show at the very beginning that the DK singularity have a toroidal modification for which the exception locus uh, has only one divisor. So somehow this is a generalization of the fact. And, uh, one of the reasons which motivate this is that uh, so um, we can prove, though it's still very weak, but we can prove ACC in dimension two using this theorem. Of course, this is very weak because it's already been proven many years ago. But nevertheless, our strategy doesn't look like it's a strategy that can only work in the mind. While Alexei's strategy was about classification of singularities, this is, we don't use anything about classification of singularity in dimension two. So somehow we hope that it can be generalized in higher dimension. Um, in two minutes, I would like to give an idea of the proof. So we talk about something which is toroidal. So we work analytically around the point P. So let's suppose that P is a point which is somehow, uh, uh, let's consider P, uh, the variety X around the point P in an analytic neighborhood. So let's suppose P is a point in X, okay? And let's, let's consider the number of components of coefficient one in uh, passing through theta, uh, passing through P in theta. This number I call it M, okay? So if we have M equal to three, then you remember at the beginning I say that the characterization of toric pairs is that if the sum of the coefficient is equal to the dimension of the variety, then it will be toroidal. So in particular, if, this, if it has three components of coefficient equal to one, then automatically it's toroidal. So we are happy. Actually, sorry, I should have said even before, m is always less or equal than three. And again, this is the thing that I said at the very beginning. The sum of the coefficient is always less or equal than the dimension of x. So it cannot be bigger than three. 
Uh, if it's three, then we're happy. So now the question is, what about smaller value? So let me just go very briefly to show how to go from m equal to zero to m equal to one. Let's assume the term is equal to zero. I want to show you what are the difficulties in, uh, in this program, I mean, in this theorem. And actually, the proof is very involved. So somehow, there are many things that we still don't understand, which, for which we hope that uh, it can work in general. So what happens if m is equal to zero? Well, m equal to zero is pretty easy. Why? Because we, since we know that, since x theta is not guilty, there exists e such that the log discrepancy is equal to zero. There are many, many e probably. But let's take one e with this property. And then I say at the beginning, well, but since this is less than one, since x is guilty, we know that there exists an extraction of, oops, no, f is a bad name. There exists g from y, it's also a bad name, so w to x, such that exceptional locus of g is exactly equal to e. Oh, if it's guilty, throw the modification, you can take an identity. So there's nothing to prove. If you, take, if, it's, if you start with x theta guilty, and you take f equal to the identity, for my definition, that's a guilt, uh, that's a toroidal modification. Because toroidal modification means that it's toroid at the generic point of local echo center. If there are no local echo center, there's nothing to prove. So that's, uh, that's the story. OK, sorry. I'm going to steal only two more minutes. Um, so what do we know? We know that if we, after we take the blue up, we know that kw plus theta w plus e is equal to g star of kx plus theta. OK, so you see, we create a component of coefficient equal to 1. But we need to be very careful. So you see, from m equal to 0, we arrive to m equal to 1. Because this is a component of, this is going to be my gamma. And m for gamma is going to be equal to 1. But what is the problem? It looks nice, right? But what is the problem? Is that we don't know how many zero dimensional local echo center there are. Well, it's the same M as here, but you replace theta with gamma. So if you want, this is some theta. OK, so you see there could be arbitrarily many local echo centers inside here. And there is no, I mean, if there are arbitrarily many, then there is no way to continue this program. Because for each of these points, you need to construct a log resolution. So it's, it's just not going to work. So in dimension three, we are happy because we use BMB and everything works. I am hiding lots of things. But by BMB, the number of zero dimensional log, zero dimensional log canonical center is bounded. In higher dimension, so it's a question that for which I don't know the answer. Is it true that if we take a log funnel, then the number of zero dimensional log canonical center is bounded by universal constant, which depends on the dimension. And somehow this is where we are stuck in higher dimension. We don't know how to prove this theorem. Then once we know this, the argument works quite well and everything else uh, proceeds quite well. We just need to increase m from one to three. Uh, there are many steps which I don't have time to describe, but more or less this is the idea. Okay, sorry for taking the time. Thanks very much.